first memories uh, actually are um, I I initially I was brought up on North Hull Estate in Hull, um, played a bit of football um, for me um, primary school there, and then my mum and dad moved from there to to West Hull, um, and the first year uh, I moved into Ainthorpe Junior High School, um, they were um, I suppose they just started a rugby league team up again they used to be quite well known for playing but they went very much football orientated for about 10 years so um and we we all had to sort of put our hands up to see and i was the last one to get picked um had a bit of a trial end up captain in the team um and it sort of went from there played for city boys at under 11s under 13s 14s 15s 16s as you do and then i got a i got a call from arthur bunting one day which uh, from Hull FC um, and, that, and that's how it all started to be fair. No time did I ever think that I was good enough to be a professional rugby league player. I think that I played um, I played for City Boys, I played for England School Boys a year young at 15 and then captained them when I was 16 um, and even then I just you know I never thought I'm gonna be a rugby league player I think I'm good enough to. Um, it was only when I um, signed for Hull that uh, that I, I started training with them, and I thought, this is good. This I like this, and 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 I felt really comfortable in that environment, and 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 that's when I when I realised that um, I actually could actually make some make some of me my career if if I if I got stuck in and had a go. So um, so yeah, it was quite surreal, really, because as I say, going going through the the grades at, at school and stuff like that it just never dawned on me even though I was a FC supporter and all I wanted to do was play for LFC um, it just it never dawned on me that I actually would do I signed in well if I start with a I got asked to sign for LFC um, Arthur Bunting rung me up and then I and then I got a call from Roger Millward uh, about a week later and I said oh we know that Hull's been in in, in touch with you. and this was around about April May time. Um, and we know that, in fact, it was just before the, the Challenge Cup final, the 1980 Challenge for FC versus LKR Challenge Cup final. So, um, and uh, we know I was being in touch with you and, and we want to talk to you. And then I thought, all oh, right. And uh, so I went over to see him out of courtesy. And, and Brian Ambolino was my um, coach at the youth club that I played at and played at Hull. Um, he was, I suppose, an agent, but just helping me out more than out else. So we went over to see Roger, and the first thing he said to me was, look, we know who's been in touch with you, we're just going to double every, anything that they want to offer you. This is Hulkington Rovers, yeah. And I went, all oh, right, that's interesting. And, um, can I have a bit of time to think about it? And they went, yeah, yeah, just, you know, we'll just, we just wanted to make sure that you, you know, you're interested and that uh, this is how much we think about you yeah, as a player and all that sort of stuff. So I went, all oh, right. So as we got outside, I just bust out roaring, and I just said, oh, I don't want to play for these bleeders, <laughs> and all this sort of stuff, and I just didn't know what to do, and Brian said, oh, just go away, You're going, I, went, I was going on holiday, actually, and um, so we went back, he said, I'll ring the club up, and then, so they, they rung the FC up, and, and they just said, look, Rovers have doubled your offer, so you either match it, or, you know, you're going you're gonna to lose out, and, and there was, I would have signed f for what they'd offered me, even though, the you know, Anyway, they, they eventually come to the party and, and I just got back off my holidays and there was a knock on the door and Peter Daly was there with Arthur Bunting and they just had a contract ready for me and just said, look, there you go, we set, you know, we'll match whatever they've done and, and I signed it. And then that, that's how I, I initially got on, on, onto, uh, onto Hull. And, and, then, and then obviously that was just before the cup final, the Derby Cup final. And I trained all that summer and um, I played a couple of games for the Colts and then all of a sudden it was quite funny because I think Tim Wilby come up to me and then I played for the A team as well and Tim Wilby after the A team game come up to me and he said you know something you could end up playing first team football this year the way you're going and I went all oh, right and and ultimately I played another first team game and then Arthur rung me up and said are oh, you playing at Salford I think it was in November you're playing against Salford at the Boulevard on Saturday so get yourself down here on Thursday and and that's how it all kicked off, really. As a player and a supporter, I think, you know, I started supporting them in, I think it was around about 77, something like that. Um, they they got relegated that year, and then we all, and then we 78, 79, sort of went back up. 
um, unbeaten, and I went to every game that season. It, you know, it was it was a remarkable period in the club's history, and then to sign on from was was absolutely phenomenal. And then, you know, the getting the likes of the Kiwis, Gary Kemble, James Lulawai, and Dana Wara at first, uh, and obviously with Stalo and John Muggleton, you know, just added to the squad. And I think the squad went from a, a team that was renowned as plodders with a bit of skill in knocker um, to an exciting uh, all-round team um, once the Kiwis come over and stuff like that I think you know we and, and to dominate the game like we did for for maybe five years uh, was absolutely fantastic and uh, it was very special squad to be part of. I went to the Derby final in 80 and uh, on a bus that was full of both Hull and Rovers supporters and to get beat by the dark side, as you'd say. Who, did, to be fair, deserved to win uh, on that day, I think, uh, was quite soul destroying. And then within, what, two years to, to come off the bench at Wembley and play was, was just unbelievable. And, and then obviously the, um, the replay, when we actually went, we played with us in the Premiership final the, the Saturday prior to that at Headingley and, and we got beat. Um, uh, and fortunately for me, I had a reasonable game and scored. And, and Arthur said to me, "Oh, you, you're playing in the replay, and you know it was it was such a, an awesome experience." And and obviously to score the try that sealed the, the win under the post, and then in front of all the old supporters, and then obviously the the cup celebrations after was uh, was just a really you know fantastic feeling. Um, the year after we went to Wembley. <laughs> And got beat by Featherstone, which you know, it's, I think that uh, there's a story in that itself. I think which is probably would not won't be on here long enough to tell. But I just thought our preparation was very, very poor, to be honest, as a, as a club, um, uh, as much as a team. So, and we deserve to get beat. And then obviously the epic at, in '85. Um, where Wigan beat us and it's um you know I look back on that final and and you know that up until this year the club's never won at Wembley and and um, we had a t fantastic opportunity to do that I missed I think four kicks pressure on Crooks already kicked one penalty oh he struck it well but no not got the direction and for somebody that was um, prided his set on, on being an half a decent kicker to be fair and, and, and generally kick most pressure kicks um, it was quite it was quite upsetting for me um, uh, especially being a captain as well so um, but yeah it's you know it was that was sort of the uh, the closing down of, of the club really and, and in regards to success um, for, for a long period of time just and it, Players started to move on, and, and we had a fairly young team that, at that at that time as well, and and things just just went from bad to worse. Arthur lost his job, I think, a year later. Uh, I ended up getting sold to to Leeds, um, along with Scoey and and the rest history really. And obviously, I think the the Ellen Road Test match against New Zealand, I sort of redeemed myself to a certain extent. Uh, uh, quite ironic, really, because the <laughs> um, the penalty came about. I think Dana Wara smacked somebody or, oh sorry no that was it, uh, there was a scrum I think and then it all kicked off in the scrum and then Danes jumped in then all of a sudden the police have got involved and it was round about where the dugouts were near the halfway line and um, uh, and then it's and all hell let broke, let, let broke loose and then and obviously the police got involved and then when it settled down and, and they're all going oh we'll kick to touch and I just went I think there was about three or four minutes to go and I just went, I said to him so just give me the ball, I'll we'll go for goal. And but this is dramatic, it's way out on the touchline. It's 27 yards out, and what a pressure kick. Lee Crooks, the substitute to take it. Six points to four to New Zealand. Everything hinges on this kick. He lost it. Oh, it's a magnificent kick! A magnificent kick! A smile on Harry Pinner's face, six points each, and what a way to come back in a test match. I placed a kick, and, and to be fair, I was, I was reasonably confident 
that you know I knew if because I'd been striking the ball really well that day as well. You know, if I connected well, then you know um, that that it'd go over. And I was very much a uh, a person that I I used to like to you know if I kick the ball straight, it goes. You know, sometimes you had to allow for a little bit of wind, but generally I was very much you know if you point it in the right direction, you kick it straight, it'll go over. And that's exactly what happened. And um, I can remember turning around. I'd kicked the goal and I turned around to run off and all I could see was Maurice Bamford had jumped up and smashed his head on the roof of the dugout. So, um, and and yeah, so it, it was it's, it was quite a quite a, a move. Not I'm saying moving moving moment, but you know something that I could sit back on and say, well, at least I've redeemed myself a little bit. And I think I was fortunate to get the man of the match as well after the game. So. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to go and play in Australia in 85, 86 and 87 and, and in 87 I went to Balmain and um, I got a phone call after three games and said Ian I'm going to have to come back, Len Casey was a coach at the time at Hull and I had to come back to, to sign on for Leeds which I wasn't particularly bothered about and I, and I, and I've, I really didn't want to sign because I'd obviously been a Hull lad and I wanted to, to get the club back on its feet. Sits up nicely for Hampson on the halfway line. Leeds forwards are up quickly to take him as he tries to run the ball out. And a penalty for Wigan for lying on. First tackle on Wigan and they get a penalty. Leeds forwards mixing a little bit there as they came in to sort out Hampson early doors. I ain't got a lot of things that I look back on um, and say I, I wish I could have done that a little bit differently, but that's probably what, the only one. Uh, one of the occasions that I think that uh, if I'd have had my time again I'd have probably reacted a little bit differently but yeah I went to Leeds and um, I had a bit of a, a dodgy start to my career there to say the least um, then I got injured in the semi-final of the what were then the John Player Trophy uh, we played Wigan at Bolton uh, dislocated my shoulder out the back Gale waiting behind to play the ball Gill having a run on his own, running crossfield, straightening up. Right in front of the post, ten yards out, all the attacking, coming from Wigan. Switch to Edwards, Edwards a long pass, Gregory. Wigan trying to crash the way over. And it's all Wigan at the moment. Crooks flat on the floor, injured, it comes to Gregory. Gregory working the run around with Case, Case still going. And the referee has given an obstruction from the play of the ball. Let off for Leeds. Uh, I didn't get took to the final, which I was quite annoyed about. Um, and Malcolm come up to me and he said to me, oh, uh, Malcolm really, yeah? Um, he come up to me and he said, look, um, I've been told that you're going to be around about eight weeks, which takes you to the end of the season. Um, I want you to come and train with me. Um, because if you play one game then I'll take you on tour the 88 tour to Australia and so that gave me an incentive to uh, to get my shoulder right and, and I train with Malcolm as well as training with the club I train with Malcolm on my own for, for quite a substantial time and and the last game of the season was at Castleford uh, against Cass and I played in I played in that game and it was <laughs> I don't know if they were taking the mickey out of me or what but I can just remember uh, I was carrying the ball in and, and, and John Joyner shouted, watch his shoulder, watch his shoulder. <laughs> and that, so Malcolm must have said to him, oh, if he plays, I'm, you know, and I just thought to miss an arse and I could have played ridiculous this. But I, to be fair, my shoulder was, was, was okay. So the Casper players were pretty Yeah, well, they were, they were, they were, they were, I don't know, I think they were just, they were, they, were, they were doing it out a bit of a mickey tape more than anything else. I don't think that for one minute, if I'd have made a line break, that nobody would come back and jump on top of me and make, whether my shoulder were bad or not. But I just can remember John Joyner saying, watch his shoulder, watch his shoulder. So, um, so we, that, that's how that, that scenario happened and I ended up going on tour that year. And then while I'm on tour, Malcolm pulled me and Gary Schofield and, and said, oh, I just want you to know that I'm, I've been given, offered the coaching job at Leeds. Um, Morris had, had obviously left and, um, and he asked me what my issues were at the club and I basically told him that I didn't really want to be there and, and all this and, and that and he said to me, um, he said, well, 
you know, I'm telling you now because I want you to, are you prepared to play for me and all, can he, will he stay and play? And I went, yeah, yeah, not a problem, I'll do that. And I said, but you just need to make sure that the club are prepared to sort my contract out because at that time when I signed, I signed on a 10 year contract because the contract system had just come in. So I'd signed a contract for 10 years, which, you know, uh, nowadays you'd never get away with, but, um, so he said, yeah, I would sort the contract out. So he said, when I come back, he, he, he had a meeting with him and he said, I've been to see the board, the board are really happy. You know, he said, if you prove that you want to play for Leeds next year, um, then they're quite happy to sit down and negotiate your contract. And so that's what I did. And the following year, I think we finished third in the league. We won the Yorkshire Cup, which was the first trophy they'd won for God knows how long. Still coming forward, Castleford. Oh, and an interception. The second and Gibson's away. Martin's after him. Gibson's got 10 yards. And Gibson is going to score. Gibson is scored. Gibson's conversion after only five minutes. Ketridge pulled the penalty back on eight minutes. That put it 6-2. But Stevenson's penalty on 10 minutes. And then Schofield's dropped goal. Made it 9-2. They go up to collect the trophy. Lee Crooks. We, we didn't do so well in the Challenge Cup, but I thought we played really well during the year. And, and obviously, at the end of the year, I'd, I got all the awards. So players, Player of the Year, Coaches, Player of the Year, all that. Supporters, VPs. Um, and then Malcolm left, <laughs> went to Halifax, I think. And, and uh, David Ward come in and I'd mentioned to David and I just said, look, you know, this is the situation we're in at the moment and the club said this and he went back and he, he went, he said, I'll sort it out for you. And he went there and, and then he come back to me and he just said, they've said, you, you know, they want to see you do it for another year. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. And I just walked off and uh, I, I was, a, I think I was away from the club for about six weeks and um, Scoey come and Gary Schofield come to me two or three times and said, "Look, come back and play, and we'll try and get something sorted out." Um, and I think I ended up. I went back and I played one game, and then Castleford come in and, and signed me for the same amount of money. So, um, and and that's when when my career started to pick up again. You know, Daryl was as much as we disagreed at times um, on how I should play. Um, the, his man management skills were, were fantastic and he, he really got me out of a mess that I was in and, and that was it. So it sort of rejuvenated me a little bit but we had a, it, we had a few issues, it was just before Christmas and, uh, and we had a, there were a couple of issues um, over the Christmas period that, that um, I probably didn't enamour me saying uh, that which, well. Which uh, well, d all to do around drink and stuff like that, which is usually the case. Um, when I did something wrong, it, it was more about, I think that we, I missed a training session. Um, uh, there was about four or five of us that missed a training session um, on the, on the uh, Mad Friday thing that um, before Easter, Fuddle Day, as you call it, for before Christmas, sorry. Uh, and so we are, we went for a drink and and then um, and obviously were a part time sport then as and all that sort of stuff which but it still was was probably the wrong thing to do or was the wrong thing to do, um, and we went for a drink and and three of the lads um, said uh, he said oh we're well we're going now and we're, we're, we're off training so I said well, you're going to turn up for training when you've had a drink and that and I went yeah 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 so and I, with that something I wouldn't do actually I just think you know I thought. I'd, so, and we was actually playing, um, was playing Hull, I think it was, um, that, that weekend, um, or on the, on the, over the Christmas period, I think it was. And, and anyway, I, did, I said, well, I'm not going, I'm not going to go training drunk. I might, you know, if I've had a drink, I'm away. If he's going to drop me, he'll drop me because I'm not trained. And, and that's what I did with another player, which won't be named, but, um, and that's what happened, and, and that's that was me, me probably me uh, one of only two runnings I had with Daryl um, um, throughout my me, me career there, with, um, and he dropped me, and rightly so. And um, JJ come and John Jaina come and had a chat with me and went, look, you know, you 
the few people have put the neck on the line for you here, you know, you've, it's not the best start you've had, and I appreciated that, and uh, and I apologise to the uh, to the players and, and 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 the coaching staff, and and that was it really, and then and then everything sort of sort settled down, and um, we we had some some quite a lot of success. We ended up getting to the the Challenge Cup final in '92 uh, against Wigan, um, and which again was a um, for me, um, quite frustrating because um, I was w really pumped up and, and ready to play uh, that day. And I can remember um, after about I don't know, maybe 15 minutes or so, Andy Platts carried the ball in and, uh, and I've gone in to tackle him and he's dropped his shoulder and he's hit me on, hit me on my shoulder and we've, we've collided and, it, and he's, um, my body sort of, sort of concertinaed and uh, I ended up splitting my pelvis open. Um, basically, so I pulled all the muscle around my pelvis and that, and and that was me gone for the day, and which was really frustrating. And I can, Daryl kept saying, "Get up, get up, and see if you can run," and all that sort of stuff. And I just couldn't move my legs. It was like just really surreal. Alex, I would think that it's a huge blow. Lee Crooks coming off. Well, you can see the problem down here, can't you? He's having treatment now, and. Uh... It looks as though it's his knee, and uh, he's not one of these lads who likes coming off the field, but he's, uh, he's in a little bit of pain here. This will be a tremendous blow to Castleford. We let them get a bit of a jump on us, and then we uh, we come back a little bit, and then we missed a try, I think. Steady missed an opportunity in the corner, and and, um, and then they just ran away a little bit with it at the end. Um, and that, and I thought to myself, and you know, it was frustrating then because I thought we were just we were just getting to be the makings of a, a quite a good tide. Um, Obviously, I signed in 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 the ninety in 90, Christmas of nineteen ninety one. Um, Steady signed just after me, I think it was, or just before me. Um, and then we signed uh, Tara Nikau, uh, and then uh, Mike Ford came over. Um, so we the nucleus of the team was starting to gel. Um, and then um, Daryl went back to Australia, and um, John Joyner took over, and, and and that was a natural progression because John was. Had been an assistant coach um, for two and a half years, I think. Played, played assistant playing position for the first year, and then went as a coach the second year. and And I think that you know he brought uh, Richie Blackmore over and and, Ta and and Tony Kemp, and all of a sudden we had a team that I thought was uh, as good a team that I'd played in. Um, and that uh, uh, not better, but as good as the team that I played in at Hull, um, and um, we had a mixture of uh, players that were uh, very, very skillful, very athletic, very hard, um, and um, you know, the ninety three ninety four season I think was probably the best that the club had had for for a long time. Um, we. Um, we got to the Yorkshire Cup final and won that. Um, we got to the Regal Trophy final and won that against Wigan. Um, uh, a game that I think everybody expected us to get beat because that was at the beginning of the that invincible sort of Wigan team that went to Wembley 10 years on the trot and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic amount of enthusiasm, fantastic amount of commitment from Castle, but where did it come from? Well, you know, self-belief more than anything else. The, the club's got a group of players together this season that can match it with anybody, and we knew that we could we could beat anybody, and I think probably the, the media attention that, that Wigan gave, writing us all off saying that the world's on favourites, that added to a spare for the lads, but, you know, full credit to the boys and the coaching staff, fant absolutely fantastic. Lee Crooks with the trophy, the first Yorkshire team since 1985 to win it. We went there very confident of, of being able to play them and beat them because we played them in the first game of the season and we beat them at Weldon Road, 30 odd points to summit. We'd played them again, I think, and beat them quite convincingly. And, and so we were quite confident that we were we could do the business and that's exactly what happened and I think we were beaten 38-2 I think the scoreline was and uh, and we weathered a, they had a try disallowed Jason Robinson had a try disallowed and we and that was a turning point really because they put us under the pump just after half time for a long period of, a long period about 10-15 minutes and we defended and defended they had a try dis disallowed and then we went to the other end and scored 
Um, and then I scored the the last try um, again under the post, which is quite ironic, I suppose. Um, and uh, and kicked the goal, and and the, and the rest history. I think that, uh, and then we 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 finished third in the league that year as well. And and we probably could have won it if with a um, just a couple of daft naivety things during the season. And and we also went to the Premiership final that year, which Wigan beat us. And they also beat us in the Challenge Cup semi-final. It was a tremendous year that year, and I think that um, the unfortunate thing about it was that um, there'd been some uh, change of in the at the top director-wise, and um, the club usually when you contract had once your contract had come into its last twelve months, then the club always renegotiated you, uh, and unfortunately. Um, after that year, the, that was the last year, I think, of uh, that T and Towers and Kempis and, and Richie Blackmore's contracts were up, and and they hadn't renegotiated them. But by the time that the club had got round to renegotiating them, they'd all signed for different clubs, um, and that sort of broke the team up a little bit. And, and unfortunately, we went down a bit of a downward spiral then, uh, and. It got to about, I think, 97 was my last year when I retired and, and John, had, John, I think, had, had, had lost his job in um, 96, at the end of that season. Um, um, a lot of it of his own, not of his own doing. Um, you know, I think he was negotiating to swap Tony Smith with uh, Nigel Wright at Wigan. And they just and then it, uh, and Casper went over there just for for cash only, but it wanted a lot of money at the time. Uh, so we lost another player, and the sort of team dwindled a little bit. John lost his job. Uh, Mick Morgan took over, and then Stuart Raper come in um, for the start of the '97 season. And by that time, I just I, I thought to myself, I had an opportunity to go back to Hull, and I didn't. Um, because of the the messed me about a little bit um, at the time, which is the, the one thing I wanted to do, and the club openly admitted that they would be quite happy to let me go if I wanted to go because they knew that obviously it was my hometown club and I'd like to finish my career there. Uh, in some ways, I'm glad I didn't because um, I want at my best then, and and I didn't want to really sort of my, all my memories that have got there have all been about success, and and I didn't really want to go back and make me sound like a a pillock for out for want of a better word, but um, that year I just knew that the game were getting quicker and quicker, and it was the start of the Super League era and all this sort of stuff. And um, I it got to the time I can remember playing at Oldham at the football club. We're playing Oldham, and the scrum half just went round me like a dose of salts uh, under the post, and I just thought to me, saying, you know, this game is I've lost me, you know, it's just got too quick." And I also had a lot of trouble with my knee as well, and 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 the both of them together it made it easy for me to say, you know, I'm going to have to retire. I think the big thing was the doc pulled me in and just said, look, Lee, you, you know, we you've had some issues with your knee. I've seen a surgeon, he's seen your things. You need to retire, or else you're not going to be able to walk when you finish. And that sort of made the decision easy for me, as much as it was upsetting at the time when I spoke to the players um, uh, about calling it a day. Um, you know that was that was it, and to be fair to Stuart Raper, he, he kept me on as on the because I still had six months of my contract left, and he kept me on on the coaching staff, and I coached, uh, helped coach the academy team that year as well as did some bits and pieces with the first team. So, um, yeah, it it wasn't the, the most ideal way to finish, but um, you know I think that the beginning and the end of my careers have always been. I, I look like to look back and think to myself, you know, really successful. Um, the little bit in the middle could have been a lot better, and um, but you know, as I said, you know, I won't change apart from the middle bit. I won't change anything. So, ultimately, end of the day, I mean, I've been quite daft with money in regards to. I've always helped myself short, and if I say always help myself short, I'll tell you a story. Um, I sound like Max Bargraves there, didn't I? <laughs> um, it's a story that got reversed back to when I when I was at Hull, and um, 
I got I asked Knocker uh, my contract, my initial contract when I signed um, uh, was worth eighteen grand, um, and that was including some money I got up front, some money for playing for Great Britain, some money for playing first team games, and I got all that within eighteen months. And um, I asked Knocker, Steve Norton, um, my contract. I've got my money in my contract. You know what do I do? What what do I need to do to go in? So he said, well, go. You need to go into the boardroom. You see the chairman. Uh, you need to tell him that you want twenty-five grand a year. Now this is like nineteen eighty-two. Um, you want twenty-five grand a year for three years because you're supposed to be the best player. You want to build a team around you. All this blah 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 blah. And and I went, all oh, right. So I wrote, started a meeting out with the chairman, and I went in and. I was just thinking, 25, it's a lot of money, 25 grand. Like, my house was only worth 18. I'm thinking, and yeah, I went in and I, I ended up asking for 15, come out with 10. So, and I, that's that's the story of my life, to be fair. So, and uh, so it, but I've never, it's one of them where I never played, I didn't play the game for money, I played the game because I loved it. And, and, I, and, and that's probably, I suppose, if you look, my two ex-wives, and my partner now are probably thinking you plank, because, uh, but that's just how it. That's just how it was. And and so when I look back at me, said, and I've, you know, I thought I got quite reasonably well paid for what I did, and and you know, certainly at the back end of my career, uh, I was on parity with the majority of, of, of players. Um, there were quite a few players that were getting a lot more than me. And and do I? Well, I bothered not really now because I got what I asked for. Nobody. Um, Apart from that, I generally ask for what I, I, I thought I was worth, and whether I thought it's insure or not, that's fair enough. But um, so no, it's it's one of them things where I just think to me saying, you know, I've, I've enjoyed my career. I got, you know, I got, I did all right out of it. the Leeds bit that if I was going to earn any money it'd have been at Leeds and that's probably what annoys me the most because you, you knuckle down there and it was quite an affluent club and and obviously um, I think um, you you know you, good players that have gone there and gone on and kicked on you know always end up you know, you're generally all right so that's probably one of the one of the reasons why I probably could kick this in a little bit but ultimately you know no I've got no regrets really the least, but it was it was it was how it was handled. I think more than anything else. Um, and then and then what really upset me was um, obviously the 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 opportunity where they said to me, you know, we'll sort your contract out if you show you want to play for us. Well, look, I don't think you can show a club any more about wanting to play than winning every award that the, the club had at that that particular time. So um, and and that's what frustrated me for them to go back on the word. Um, was quite annoying and, and uh, I suppose at that time um, I thought to me saying that I'm quite a, a good commodity so um, so I never used to let people take the, the mickey out of me more than you know um, and, and that's really what that's, that did up, upset me and, and, and it took me a long while even when I retired afterwards it, it that was the biggest learning curve I made when I uh, that, that that gave me when I when I retired is that you've got to remember that you're not the commodity that you you was when you were playing so you had to change your attitude a bit and it took me a while to get used to that because um, uh, but other than that you know the lead thing it was just that was purely and simply you know if they'd have turned around and said to me we'll sort you out with a new contract at a stayed it was that was the be all and end all of it to be fair and they didn't and so that's why I left. 85 I got a phone call from Paul Harrison of the, from the Sun um, around about January time and he, just, he basically just said oh do you want to um, would you like to play in Australia and I went I've never really thought about it and he said well uh, I've had somebody from Western Suburbs come on saying they want a, a prop for prop stroke second row forward um, and obviously I thought yourself and if you're interested, I'll put you on to a minute, and that's that's basically how it happened. I spoke to uh, Rick Wade, for, uh, who was the chief exec at the Western Suburbs Club at the time, um, and we sorted a, a deal out. And I went over after the 
Um, 85 Cup final. I was with uh, Janet, my first wife then, with uh, Emma and Stuart, my two oldest kids. Now, uh, Stuart was quite young. Uh, Emma was about three, I think, at the time. And uh, we had them two uh, on a um, Japanese air airline flight um, from Manchester, sorry, no, from Heathrow to Sydney, which took 35 hours. So uh, it was a, a bit of a traumatic uh, experience flying over. Uh, but once we, um, once we got there, they took me straight to the ground um, to do a photo call, at, uh, which were about seven o'clock on the Saturday morning. Um, so um, the, probably not the greatest experience. And then, uh, then they asked me if I wanted to sit on the bench for the first team. And I went, uh, don't be stupid, basically. Um, I said, but I would, I will play for you 23s if you want for half a game, just to blow some cobwebs off. And that's what I did. And it was against Souths at Pratt and Park, I think, at the time. Um, and um, they, as usual, the uh, Australians wanted to uh, welcome to Australia and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I think I, I, can't, I, I can't remember if I scored or I, can, I kicked two or three goals. Uh, I think one from the touchline that I can remember. And we won the game, and then quite ironic. And then when I got changed, I just left all my kit in the in the dressing rooms, and they're all saying, "What's all this?" Because in Australia, you take your shorts and your boots and your sh socks back with you. You just leave your shirt. So and I, I had all my gear there, and Abby Smales, who was um, the uh, rubber stroke strapper at the club, was origin originally from Feverston. So no, that'll be Crooks's. Um, Crooks's gear that so that's that's big so that then I went to the left it there went to the leagues club um, and um, the first team won as well so the, Nobby Clark who was uh, um, the first that got man of the match that that day um, I think he, he blurted out some I hope Lee Crooks um, don't want my position um, blah 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 or something like that so he, he better not hold his breath and all that sort of stuff and so I thought oh this is going to be interesting then and then I played. The, I trained the week after, and I, we played at Penrith at Penrith Park, and, uh, and I, I think I kicked three goals and scored a try and got man of the match. Was on TV, and everybody sort of settled down then. So it was a bit, and it was a fantastic club, and it obviously black and white, and it just everything sort of fit really, really well, and it was very similar type of club to Hull. Um, and the biggest challenge for me was uh, not so much about proving that I was a good player because. Confident wise, I knew that I was there, and, and their type of game was quite. It suited me because you could um, people used to jump out the line quite a lot, yeah, and 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 you you could pick little gaps and stuff like that. And um, so I I really I, d I did really well there, and obviously we we won two or three games I think that that year, and the 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 club was about to go into I think if they finished bottom. Um, they, they was going to get kicked out of the league or something like that and, and I, don't, I think we didn't finish bottom, I think we finished second from bottom or something like that but I think the biggest compliment that anybody had paid to me was that um, uh, one of the one of the people from the uh, New South Wales Rugby League said to Rick Wade um, after the season finished that, that that's probably your best signing you've ever made because um, he's helped you stay up, uh, the club stay in the comp and and um, after that year, Balmain wanted to sign me the year after, and but I signed with, I signed with with West pure, purely and simply because I wanted to thank them for as a reward for they they stuck the neck out on the line um, to let me get to get over there. So I, I thought I owed them it to have another year, and that's what I did. Um, they had doubled my salary in that, so it was it helps. Um, but um, but no, I went there, and then obviously I. I the third year I went to Balmain and then that's the scenario with, with Leeds which sort of soured it a little bit. Team of the 80s it was. I suppose certain accolades that you that you, you receive during your career and I think there's some of them are, are absolutely fantastic and, and some of them you think oh well um, it's nice and that but you know it's I think that that to, to be selected in a in a team that when you look at you look at the team and 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 the and the side they had some really good players playing from eighty to nineteen ninety um, and uh, I can remember going over to uh, uh, they they invited me over flew me over paid me expenses and stuff like that and I took our Ben with me uh, which was great um, 
and you know a tremendous award really to especially in Australia um, and, and I, as I said I really although I only played two and a bit two well I went over there twice I won't say two years because we went three months at a time so but to have such an impact on on a club um, and and be rewarded for that impact you know really is is, is very special um, and especially in Australia which you know, he's re renowned for for competition and, and the intensity and, and and whatever. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, it's something that I'll always treasure. And and even when I go back there now, um, you know, um, they invite me to the club. You know, people talk to me, and and that it's it's a tremendous feeling, really. And it's what it, I suppose it's one of those you look back and you you think to me, well, it, it makes everything really worthwhile because you know. To be able to have an impact on a on a club uh, and, and on the game at, at such a high magnitude, it, you know, it's, it, it, it makes everything just well worthwhile. People always said to me that I'd make a really good coach, and and uh, um, but I think what I did, I went about everything the wrong way, to be honest. And and I, what I should have done was I should have made sure that I, I became somebody's assistant first, and and I think that. I suppose the ironic thing is that um, when I finished, when I retired, um, I was doing a bit for Sky, and Sky asked me if I'd uh, do the um, summarising for the academy games when they televised them that first year, and and I said yeah, and then obviously um, I was all set to do that, and then Keithley asked me if I'd be there, if they'd, I'd come and have an interview to be their coach, and. Uh, John Joyner, they asked John Joyner and John turned it down and he said for, for a number of reasons I think but he said if, why don't you speak to Crooksy because I think he might be interested so they, they end up talking to me and uh, I end up taking the job so I had to get backwards on the on the Sky thing which is probably the biggest uh, or the poorest decision I've made <laughs> without being disrespectful to Keefley that I've made because Phil Clark got that job and obviously we all know where he is now so <laughs> um, so I went. I, d I did the coaching job. At, I was head coach at Keefley and and I, to be fair, I enjoyed it. It's a, a fantastic club, you know, great people. Um, but I, it's one of those where you had to learn as you go along, and um, and I got chucked in at the deep end a little bit, and and I made some mistakes, and 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 I don't mind admitting that. Um, I think the crunch come the year after. Um, we did all right in the first year. There was, I think, there was bottom of the league at the time, and we got up, we got them up to mid table, and, and um, the players, you know, really had a dig for me, and, and it was good. And the the problem come the year after when they got a new owner and he wanted me to talk contracts with players, and I just didn't want to do that. I, you know, I said to him, you know, that if a head coach starts talking about contracts and money to players, and it, then there's going to be some friction, and then that makes their relationship quite sour. Um, and and they won't have it. They, they had to, I had to do it. So and and I I upset a few players purely simply because I didn't think they were worth the money that they were worth, that they were, they were asking for. So um, so things went a little bit pear shaped towards the end, and um, and I ended up getting sacked for it with bluntly. So um, so then I fair enough, not an issue. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it was a learning curve. Um, in between time I did the Yorkshire job with Andy Gregory was doing the Lancashire job um, David Waite had just come over um, to work for the RFL I did a little bit with uh, York I, York asked me to uh, to coach them and and we, we assembled quite a good squad of players I thought to be fair at that, that time um, and then they went into liquidation which and the players never got paid so uh, quite a few of them left there was a few that stayed because they were York lads and they just wanted to help the club and then we basically had a what you'd call a community amateur team playing and, and uh, just to cap it all off we went to witness and um, two players didn't turn up on the bus out the 17 so we and you had to have a bench so I put the physio and the, um, uh, the physio on the bench uh, and I sat on the bench and the physio used to run on so he put his name down he didn't actually sit on the bench but his name was down and then and then I and I tried to rotate the front rows we got beat 96 nil or something like that and um, 
and that because obviously my knees were shot but um, it's probably the, the only thing that I could do and and we got through that year and then um, and then the club just basically said to me oh you're gonna have to reapply for your job so I went what after what, what, what's all all gone off and they went yeah yeah so I went well don't worry about it I won't re reapply and I'm you know I've had enough of this anyway so and that was that and then I got an opportunity to work for the RFL for seven or eight years and and um, that was that was very very um, engaging I think for me because it, it, it sort of set the platform for what I wanted to do and it was all all based around youth development and um, I was a performance officer at the time and that and then um, gravitated up to head of talent identification which is basically the recruitment and and uh, identification selection process for all the rep gate teams that sit below the England side so um, I had a fantastic eight years there and it set a platform for me um, for myself give me a great education about you know the game and um, and then I'll so I got itchy feet a little bit and, and got asked to talk to Justin Morgan about being assistant coach at OKR which um, it raised quite a few eyebrows not only at OKR but at LFC but I went there and he had eight, uh, 12 months there and, and you know Morgs were a great coach and, and, and the players were fantastic I thought that um, it was you know I really enjoyed me saying late a lot and, and I just but I just couldn't see me saying really doing that for a long period of time and then there was an opportunity at Hull for a head of youth and, and I decided to go there uh, which upset Neil Hudgel I tried to apologise to him and say you know it's not about the club it's about just my opportunities and that and there was a couple of things that went off at the club at, at Hull that at Hull KR that again you know being promised one thing didn't happen sort of stuff but um that, that made my decision a little bit easier to, to move on there. So, um, so that's what that that was that, and uh, and I went at and I had twelve months at at Hull, um, and then they relinquished the, the that position at that particular time because they had a restructure. Um, um, Kath Everington was at, at the club at the time, and James Rule was the chief exec. Um, so, um, and they looked to they were looking to go in another direction. So. Um, I end up sort of le leaving that role, and and that was it then. Really, I think until I got I, the Serbia thing was quite interesting because the, the RFL asked me to to do that um, that role as a build up to the World Cup qualifiers, and I really enjoyed it. It was quite interesting because I think Darren Higgins is doing a similar role now, and he come and asked me for some advice about place and the people and stuff like that and it were absolutely fantastic place the people are really um, as much as they, they can be quite volatile in, in Belgrade and Serbians are a bit animated for want of a better word um, you know the, the players are fantastic and, and they're always wanting to learn and, and that so and I really enjoyed myself and got some great friends there as well so so now it's been it's been quite a, a wide ranging um, sort of career um, and I've always tried to, to learn at every opportunity. I don't uh, pronounce to know everything about the game and I don't pronounce to, to think that I ever will know everything about the game. But um, I suppose me, my, um, my, the main thing is that I quite like to debate stuff and, and I am quite opinionated. And if you, don't, if you think I'm wrong, then I'm quite happy to say that I'm wrong. But you've got to try and prove, give me some evidence that I am. Um, generally most people don't so we'll see what happens you know my life revol still revolves around you asked uh, Jane my partner you asked me ex-wives uh, uh, the my kids you know I've been I, the rugby I just live die and sleep rugby it's it's just it's been a big part of my life for 35 years and um, and still is a big part of my life you know i do an ambassador role at, at hull fc um i work for the rfl um uh, i'm based up in newcastle um seconded to newcastle thunder rugby league team running their academy now and it's just you know it's a fantastic experience and i and i think that you know when the day comes when i've got nothing to do with rugby league then i can see me saying being quite a lonely person <laughs> 
magnificent kick from uh, Lee Crooks.